Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for the wrong which he did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, of your father. And Joseph wept, and they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. We have now entered into Holy Week, according to many churches, the most solemn time of the church year. In this final week before Easter, we journey with Jesus himself in his final week before his passion and death. The week starts off with a bang, with triumph, Palm Sunday. He enters into the city of Jerusalem on the exaltation of the crowds, proclaiming him the rightful heir of David, the Messiah, Hosanna to the son of David. But things go down pretty quickly from there. He challenges the religious leaders of the city. He calls them out on their hypocrisy. He pronounces prophetic judgment on them and on the city. And he does all of this, claiming to speak with the authority of God himself. It's interesting. We, we normally associate preaching, effective good preaching, with our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived. And we assume that good preaching that is aligned with God's purposes automatically brings out revival and the growth of believing communities. But in Jesus' case, in this final week, it has the opposite effect. He alienates his closest supporters. He riles up his opposition against them. He energizes them to bring him to judgment. Now, do we not doubt that Jesus spoke the very words of God, that he spoke them with the authority of God himself? And yet, in the night before he was betrayed and handed over to suffering and death, even his own disciples fled his side in shame and fear. Only his father was with him then. Interestingly, though, this is right where his father wanted him to be. He was living perfectly in his father's will. The whole story progresses. We're clear that Jesus is in his father's will, doing exactly what his father wants him to do. Again and again, the gospel writers tell us that Jesus tries to explain to his disciples that he must suffer before entering his glory, but they cannot see it. Indeed, the father himself seems to be hiding it from them. On the night before he died, our Lord himself even asks for the Father to give him another option. But he nevertheless submits his will to the Father's, knowing that his will is the only good, perfect, and righteous way forward. Because as he knows from the prophet Isaiah, it was God's will to crush him. How can this be? How can God will in the midst of human sin? Were his accusers right to want to hand him over to death? Was it good that they handed him over? Were the Romans just in sentencing him to death? Of course not. How do we square God's good will with the depravity of human fallen choices? The crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ is not the first time this dilemma comes up in the story of salvation. In fact, it comes up many times before. And one of the great early examples in the Old Testament can be found right in the last chapter of the book of Genesis. The patriarch Joseph has all the reason in the world to hate his brothers. They have sold him into slavery when he was a young boy for no other reason but they were envious of him. And the suffering that he was made to endure as a result of that choice was immense. And now here they are. He has arisen to a power to a position of great power. And his brothers are now come to him, recognizing that he has a lordship over them, and they are begging him to have mercy on them. When Joseph hears this, you might think that he would gloat in this moment of triumph. But it's interesting what he actually does. 
he weeps. He's saddened by the brokenness which continues to define his relationship to his brothers. He's saddened that they are afraid of him. And so he comforts them and promises to take care of them and their families. But notice that even as he comforts them, he doesn't deny that what they did to him was evil. But he has learned through his suffering just what God is capable of bringing out in the midst of suffering. He says, what you have meant for evil, God has meant for good. And because he has seen the power of God to work mighty reversals in the midst of human despair, he will not now put himself in God's judgment seat. Liberated that God himself is judge, he is free now to love his brothers, to serve them. Any religion in the world needs to address the problem of human suffering if it is going to own the allegiance of thinking people. But the biblical faith is unique in how it handles this particular problem. We see that our God is so powerful indeed that he can use even evil choices of men to work his good purposes. Whether the evil that we experience is the result of our own willful choices or the choices of others, or whether it's just the result of living in a world that's groaning under the curse, we know that God is capable of bringing joy out of pain. As we enter Holy Week, let us not forget God's power. We've seen him do it in the life of Joseph. We have seen him do it most triumphantly in the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whether it be the devil, whether it be the world, whether it be our own hearts bent on evil, we know that God can use these things for his good purposes. Now, of course, we don't always know what God is up to. We usually don't know what God is up to in these things. But we do know that God can. We know more importantly that God does use all things for good purposes for those who place their trust in him. So as we make our journey to the cross in this final week before Easter, let us put our trust in its power, the power of God to redeem even the most heinous of human evil and misery for his good purposes. And we will find him more than sufficient for our good.